the deity of Christ in the second century. Put here the 100 so that you don't have to do math. Obviously, the first century doesn't begin with this one. But I want to talk about the doctrine of the deity of Christ as it was historically understood in the second century as I do some writing on this. I wanted to uh, share that and make that available through video. But in writing this, obviously, it's not totally complete. Uh, just in talking about history in general and historical theology, uh, the case for the deity of Christ is something that we don't prove from history. We, we prove it from the word of God. But, but church history is helpful as we look at how did Christians historically respond to the fact of divine revelation? Uh, in order to prove that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, is God in the flesh, we have to go to scripture. We have to prove it exegetically from the text and what the God meant to communicate in his, his word. But we also should understand that the Bible is not just a list of historical truths or of theological truths that give us, here's, here's your list of doctrine, here's your list of 10 things, 12 things, 100 things. But the Bible is a historical book. It's not a textbook, but it is the story of God's intervention in a real world that he has created in real space and time that he has intervened in to bring about the story of redemption for his ultimate glory in Christ. Uh, the reason that we're saved is because of a real historical event that has theological significance, the death of Christ for his people on the cross and his resurrection and his reign. Those are those are real things that, that happen. The gospel hinges on their historicity. And so the, while we say, yes, it's inspired scripture, we have to remember that it's, it's historical events that God has acted in and through to bring about this result. So the deity of Nazareth is a historically revealed doctrine. God spoke. God spoke through his son, as it says in Hebrews 1, and also spoke through the authorized representatives of Christ, the apostles and their close associates, to pen new revelation, to interpret and explain the new covenant or the New Testament in light of the coming of Jesus. And so doctrine, distinguished from revelation proper, goes through a period of development or refinement. That doesn't mean that the truth itself that God has revealed has changed, but that the church's understanding of it becomes more fine-tuned. It becomes more precise. It becomes more um, clearly understood as usually as it's challenged, usually the forces of persecution or heresy that challenge a particular belief, bring it into sharper focus so that the church goes back to scripture, focuses on what scripture says, thinks, debates, discusses, and comes to conclusions. And now are they always perfect conclusions? Uh, no, no one who studies church history should claim that. But it is an important process as doctrine becomes the, the reaction to the spoken and written word of God. Now, I bring this up uh, because um, in Mormonism, in Jehovah's Witnesses, in uh, the Church of God, in pseudo-scholarship, and it's very common to hear college students, college professors even, saying this type of thing that uh, the deity of Christ didn't um, really come about uh, until the uh, until the Council of Nicaea at 325. And then that's when they formulated uh, the, the Trinity. So here's, you know, Council of Nicaea, 325. And you'll hear all kinds of people say this. I've heard this from Mormons. I've heard it from Jehovah's Witnesses. I haven't talked to a lot of uh, Restoration Fellowship, Church of God people, um, but I've talked to uh, uh, secular skeptics, and this is just kind of the normal thing, and I call this kind of the Da Vinci Code argument. 
that the Da Vinci Code's a fictional book. That's all that it is. But it's the Da Vinci Code is kind of cast as, even though it's fiction, it's the fiction everyone believes to be true because that's the narrative that they've been taught. Listen to this character, uh, Sir Lee Teabing. He's the guy that the main characters in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code go to and get some historical, uh, quote unquote, historical uh, information on Jesus of Nazareth. And this is some of the quotes that are typically believed, even though they're, they're totally falsifiable, they're not true. But here's some of the quotes from the Da Vinci Code. He says, until that moment in history, being I see in 325, Jesus was viewed by his followers as a mortal prophet and a great and powerful man, but a man nonetheless, a mortal. And so that's from the Da Vinci Code here. And then says, this quote goes on, Jesus' establishment as the Son of God was officially proposed and voted on by the Council of Nicaea because Constantine upgraded Jesus' status almost four centuries, which is really three centuries because four centuries later would have been too late. Uh, after Jesus' death, thousands of documents already exist, existed chronicling his life as a mortal man. Now, um, none of this is is true. Um, this can be falsified. There were not thousands of documents that will be dealt with at uh, another time, uh, if I get around to that subject. Um, but this is the narrative most people believe, and it's even believed by, by scholars. I think in uh, Richard Rubenstein's book, um, When Jesus uh, Became God, The Epic Fight Over Christ's Divinity in the Last Days of Rome. So basically, this is the, the Lost Gospels argument that, that showed Jesus as one way. They were hidden, and because of political motives, um, they were suppressed. Uh, but that's not true. And I'm going to show in this uh, particular video uh, the teachings of uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who is a writer uh, and a preacher and a bishop in the second century. Um, who lived in the first century during 35 AD, so soon after the death of Jesus is when he is born, and lives to 108, so very early in the second century. Um, and he is dealing with the heresy of docetism, which taught that uh, Jesus was God, but that Jesus was not truly uh, human, that he was not, he just appeared as a man, that's what death docetism uh, comes from a Greek word that means show up in the appearance, but the idea is that he wasn't really a man. Um, and in defending the truth of Jesus's humanity, he actually, because it goes right along with it, uh, explains in very striking ways Jesus's deity. And many of these writers, you can go through text by text and show that uh, while they're convinced of biblical monotheism, and the deity of Jesus, there's a consistent usage of the Greek term theos to Jesus. Theos is the word that we tra simply translate God. Now, uh, let me show you a few of his quotations in which he's going to call Jesus or refer to Jesus as theos. Now, I'll admit up front, theos is not the most uh, important term when referring to the deity of Christ, even though it's the word God and, and it's about Jesus being God, uh, the, this whole presentation, uh, it's, it's even more important to show that Jesus is equivalent to Yahweh of the Old Testament, the one true God, because God can sometimes be used in Old Testament and New Testament terminology in a way that's, that's more general than we mean in the West, uh, influenced by Christianity of the one true God. Sometimes God means, uh, it can mean many gods or things like this. Um, that's not how it's used with reference to Jesus, but it is important, but it's probably not the most important way to prove the deity of Christ. Um, so, but what can be easily observed about this letter, he in let's start with the epistle to the Ephesians, is that it's, it's short. And in this, there's at least four indisputable statements about Jesus being God. All of uh, Ignatius's letters are short letters uh, but they are packed with outright statements 
about Jesus being theos, Jesus being God. And there's no amb ambiguity. It's not like when he says God that he's really referring to someone else. So I have here the, the links uh, to these quotations that can be easily found online. There's some in different uh, translations, so it may read a little bit differently here and there. Let me focus mouse here and read to you from Ephesians, uh, his epistle to the Ephesians and his inscriptions. He writes, his inscription, he writes, heartiest greetings of pure joy in Jesus Christ from Ignatius, the God inspired. Now, we can focus on that, God inspired. He's not meaning scripturally, he's meaning that he's one who's following after the teachings of God, uh, but we'll not dwell on that for now. It says, to the church at Ephesus in Asia, out of the fullness of God the Father, so he's using theos there for God the Father, you have been blessed with large numbers and are predestined from eternity to enjoy forever continual and unfading glory. The source of your unity and election is genuine suffering, which you undergo by the will of the Father and of Jesus Christ, our God. Hence, you deserve to be considered happy. Okay, so obviously referring there to uh, Jesus, as I highlight there with some emphasis, Jesus Christ as God. Now he refers to God the Father as God, and he refers to Jesus Christ, our God. They are distinguished, they are differentiated as to persons, but they are both referred to as theos. Uh, another quote, second quote from Ignatius here, from Ephesians 7, 2. It says, there is only one physician, of flesh yet spiritual, born yet unbegotten, God incarnate. Genuine life in the midst of death sprung from Mary as well as God, first subject to suffering, then beyond it, Jesus Christ our Lord. So in case it wasn't clear uh, from the beginning that God incarnate refers to Jesus, he, he differentiates here again and says, Jesus Christ our Lord. And by that term Lord, we can probably make some uh, conclusions as to his view of Christ. But God incarnate means, by definition, uh, God in the flesh. Here's another one from Ignatius, from uh, Ephesians 18.2. Uh, and even though it says 18, it's, it's a sh these are short letters. But they're about a page long. It says, for our God, Jesus Christ, was conceived by Mary in God's plan being sprung both from the seed of David and from the Holy Spirit. He was born and baptized by his passion, uh, that by his passion he might hallow water. That's Ephesians 18, verse 2 from Ignatius, not biblical Ephesians. Okay, let me read another one. As a result, all magic lost its power and all witchcraft ceased. Ignorance was done away with, and the ancient king and the ancient kingdom of evil was utterly destroyed, for God was revealing himself as a man to bring newness of eternal life. What God prepared was now beginning. Hence, everything was in confusion and the destruction of death was being taken in hand. Okay. So Ignatius writes in places that are indisputable that, uh, that Jesus is clearly God in human flesh. And notice, remember, his, his point here is to defend against docetism. God was revealing himself as a man. His focus here is uh, on the humanity of Jesus, but in focusing on Jesus himself, he has to speak to his Godhead. He has to speak to his deity because you can't speak to the person of Jesus without speaking to his deity and to his humanity, at least in a biblical and true way. And so we can gather some uh, information from this data that Jesus of Nazareth, as Ignatius wrote to the uh, 
this very early letter, remember he dies by uh, about uh, 108, that's somewhat disputed, but uh, he dies uh, fairly early into the 100s in the second century. So this idea that uh, no one had ever heard of the deity of Christ or that it wasn't a normal teaching or that the church didn't believe it uh, is not true. Uh, that Ignatius is able to assume this and write this about Jesus of Nazareth to the Ephesians in such exalted and scriptural language uh, demonstrates that his assertions were already accepted, not novel. They were not new. And that the Christian tradition of the time was already established in the scriptures, whether orally or textually. You can see he uses some of the same language. It sounds like the apostles. It sounds like Paul. And so he was very steeped in the teaching of the apostles. He also uh, writes a, an epistle uh, to the Romans during this time. Uh, let me focus in on this quotation. So this is a letter written uh, as he prepared for his martyrdom. It's, it's a more personal letter, but he also speaks quite a bit about Jesus being God. It says, greetings in Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, from Ignatius, the God-inspired, to the church that is in charge of, the fair, of affairs and Roman quarters. And the Most High Father and Jesus Christ, his only Son, have magnificently embraced in mercy and love. You have been granted life, uh, light both by the will of him who willed all that is, and by virtue of your believing in Jesus Christ, our God and of loving him. You are a credit to God. You deserve your renown and are to be come on, like, congratulated. You deserve praise and success and are privileged to be without blemish. Yes, you rank first in love, being true to Christ's law stamped with, it, with the Father's name. To you then, sincerest greetings and Jesus Christ our God. For you cleave to his every commandment, observing not only their letter, but their spirit, being permanently filled with God's grace and purged of every stain alien to it. Okay, so twice there in the inscription in his letter uh, to the Romans, uh, he refers to this is... Uh, the, you know, the obvious conclusion that he believed this and that he expected his readers to know this truth and to believe it. And he also refers to God the Father and refers to them both. Um, and so this is, uh, a, again, a differentiation and distinction between persons, Jesus Christ, even though they haven't formulated the doctrine of the Trinity uh, historically yet, they're definitely speaking of Jesus as God, as monotheists, and speaking as God the Father as God. So this shows a, a, an idea of shared nature, yet differentiation and distinction in personhood. Um, another quote here. Uh, There's nothing you can see has real value. Our God, Jesus Christ, indeed has revealed himself more clearly by returning to the Father. The greatness of Christianity lies in its being hated by the world, not in its being convincing to it. And that's Romans 3.3. Uh, 3. Another one. Let me imitate the passion of my God, or the suffering of my God. If anyone has him in him, let him appreciate what I am longing for and sympathize with me, realizing what I am going through. And he's referring to his uh, martyrdom, there is coming martyrdom. He says he wants to imitate the passion of his God. Now, to, if I want to be totally fair, it does not mention Jesus right there. But the only one who suffers the passion or the suffering is Jesus. Uh, they wouldn't speak to the suffering of God the Father. That's, that's never done. Now, the cults may take these things and say, okay, well, this is just proof that the church uh, believed in multiple gods. Mormonism might say that, or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses might say that. But 
Um, what we're seeing here is, is an equality with, with God the Father. That's why you have to prove with them that Jesus is, is Yahweh of the Old Testament. So anyway, uh, likewise, as it was said in the Epistle to the Ephesians, the Epistle to the Romans, it's short, it's about a page, but within that page, uh, Ignatius calls Jesus Christ our God three times, and he calls him my God once. So this exalted and, and worshipful language is employed to speak of Jesus and demonstrates that this is an already held belief. The Father is called God, Jesus is called God, yet they are distinguished so, so as not to be understood as one single person. So there is differentiation there. Uh, I'll pick up next time on the epistle to the, uh, the Smyrnians, the church of Smyrna, uh, and the Tralians, and his letter to Polycarp, because there's more. It's not just like a quote here and there, that these quotes are not few and far between. They're, they're easy to find, they're easy to identify, uh, but they do um, show the truth that, uh, that the thesis of the Da Vinci Code is false, that Jesus' followers did not believe he was God until, the, until 325. Um, that's just demonstrably uh, untrue though it is highly believed. Now, the point is not to use history as a way to convince unbelievers of the deity of Christ. If they don't believe the scriptures, they don't believe the, the revelation of Jesus Christ it, as the word of God, in the word of God, they're not going to believe it from church history. What church history does is it helps us to see how the church reacted to the fact of God's revelation and how they formulated their beliefs. And some things they got right and some things they got wrong. Um, these quotes that I've read are not scripture. They are, though, uh, instructions of Christians to Christians of how they thought through doctrine in the early days. And what they do prove for us is that they do, is that the Christians did believe that Jesus was theos, that Jesus was God. And that can be helpful in helping us understand how doctrine was formulated over time and that we stand in solidarity with Christians from 1900 years ago, from 2000 years ago, that, that we believe the core of what they believe and they believe the core of what we believe. And so the encouragement can be there for, for Christians uh, as well as a, giving an apologetic, uh, a limited apologetic answer in the use of church history.